Okay. Welcome everyone to today's webinar, the $188 billion question, can we fix Great Lakes, the Great Lakes water and sewer infrastructure crisis? I'm Jennifer Caddick, the Alliance for the Great Lakes Vice President for Communications and Engagement, and I'll be moderating today's conversation. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. We're excited to have almost 200 people registered for today's event. And to reduce background noise, all participant lines will be muted for the duration of the conversation. We'll leave plenty of time for your questions. To ask a question, just use the question feature at the bottom of your screen, the Q&A feature, not the chat questions that'll help me manage all of that. Um, and also this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted on the Alliance for the Great Lakes uh, YouTube channel later today. For our agenda today, I'll give a brief overview of the water infrastructure challenges facing the Great Lakes region. I'll have some questions and conversation with our fantastic panelists. And then finally, we'll open it up to your questions and we'll leave plenty of time at the end for that. I'm joined today by a panel of three fantastic women. Happy Women's History Month, by the way. Uh, our panelists include Becky Hammer, who is a senior attorney and deputy director of federal water policy at the Natural Resources Defense Council, and she's joining us from Washington, DC. Hi, Becky. Uh, we have Christy Meyer, who is the associate director at Freshwater Future, and she's joining us from Columbus, Ohio. Hi, Christy. And Antonia Ogodipe, who is the water policy analyst on our team here at the Alliance for the Great Lakes, and she is joining us from Chicago. Hi, Antonia. Today's event is the third webinar in our series of conversations about the Alliance for the Great Lakes federal policy priorities. Back in January, the Alliance identified our top five Great Lakes policy priorities for both the Biden administration and the new Congress. Our top five priorities are one, prioritize environmental justice. Two, increase drinking water and wastewater infrastructure funding and stop water shutoffs. Three, fund the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and restore and strengthen clean water protections. Four, fund efforts to stop invasive Asian carp. And five, address agricultural pollution that drives harmful algal blooms. The top five asks are the same for both the Biden administration and Congress, but the details are different for each as each branch of government has different roles and responsibilities. For instance, President Biden has authority over many of the regulations and policies that the various federal agencies implement, while Congress has the power of the purse strings and has a major role in funding those agencies and programs. You'll find all the details of our policy agenda on our website, which is greatlakes.org. For today's conversation, we're focusing on priority number two, increasing drinking water and wastewater infrastructure funding and stopping water shutoffs. The Great Lakes are our world's largest fresh surface water supply. Yet many people in our Great Lakes communities do not have access to safe, clean drinking water, and that is unacceptable. Clean water is a basic need. No one should be without clean, safe, affordable water in their home. And no one should have to worry about sewage backing up in their basement or community flooding from failing wastewater systems. Communities across the Great Lakes region are struggling with crumbling, antiquated drinking water and wastewater infrastructure. Over the past year, the COVID-19 crisis has reinforced the deep connection between water and public health. Hand washing has been vital public health advice in this crisis, but you can't wash your hands and prevent the spread of this virus if you don't have access to water in your home because it is too polluted or it's been shut off. And the pandemic has tragically highlighted the inequalities in our communities. So what do I mean when I say drinking water and wastewater infrastructure? I'm talking about that full system that starts with the pipes that draw water out of a lake or river or from groundwater, bring it to a water treatment plant that supposedly treats that water and makes it safe enough for you to drink, the pipes that take that water from the plant to your house, and then once you use that water in your house, the system of pipes that carry that wastewater or sewage away from your home to a treatment plant that treats that water and then discharges that water hopefully clean, back into the source. The eight Great Lakes states need an estimated $188 billion over the next 20 years for improvements, upgrades, and repairs to this infrastructure. Paying for these projects is expensive, 
and communities face significant costs to replace and upgrade this infrastructure while maintaining health and environmental quality. And these prices, these costs drive up prices for ratepayers. Yet the costs are often not shared equitably, which underscores the importance of federal financial support from the federal government. The Great Lakes region has some of the most unaffordable water and sewer rates in the country. According to some recent research and reporting by American Public Media, some Great Lakes communities have seen water bills triple over the past decade. Lead service lines pose a special health concern for many Great Lakes residents and lead poisoning from con consuming contaminated water can cause irreversible brain damage in children. Illinois and Ohio are number one and number two in the nation for the number of lead service lines. Those are the pipes that carry water into people's homes. And Michigan recently launched an effort to replace every lead service line in the state, which was an outcome of the very public and tragic crisis in Flint, Michigan. More than 70% of all combined sewers, which collect both sewage and stormwater runoff in the United States are located in the Great Lakes region. Our co combined, water, combined sewer overflows uh, during heavy rains lead to raw or poorly treated sewage polluting our waterways. In cities with many paved surfaces and aging stormwater infrastructure, urban flooding and basement backups pose serious health risks and result in significant economic losses and climate change will just make these problems worse. Fixing our failing water infrastructure is urgent because the longer we wait, the harder and more expensive these problems will be to solve. This problem is massive, but there are steps the Biden administration and Congress can take now to make significant progress to improve our region's water infrastructure. In our 2021 federal Great Lakes federal policy priorities, the Alliance for the Great Lakes asks President Biden and Congress to propose dramatically increased funding to fix our failing drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater systems. We also ask them to include several important policies in their infrastructure proposals, including a federal ban on residential water shutoffs due to non-payment and reconnection of water service along with federal assistance programs for low-income rate players, increasing grant funding for utilities, and allocating funding for nature-based infrastructure solutions. This week, now that Congress has passed the COVID relief package, and I believe the president has signed or is about to sign it, we know the administration and Congress are turning their focus to developing a significant infrastructure bill. This is a key opportunity to provide much needed funding and also to rethink how some of these programs work so they meet the most critical needs and are being distributed equitably amongst our communities. All of this is an opportunity to protect public health, protect the health of the Great Lakes and create jobs. So there is a lot here and I know we could probably talk for many days about all this, but we'll try and get as to as much of this as we can in the next 45 minutes or so. And I know that Becky, Christy and Antonia are gonna do a great job of helping us understand all of these complex pieces and the opportunities that we have um, at the federal, state and local level. So panelists, I have a lot of questions for you. Uh, and Becky, I'm gonna start off with you, um, with your view from Washington. Um, can you just help us, before we dig into some of the opportunities, can you help just briefly explain the broad strokes of how the federal government funds infrastructure programs? Sure, and thanks for having me on. Um, so there are a number of different federal programs that fund water infrastructure, but by far the largest is what are known as the state revolving funds or SRFs, um, and there are two of them, the Clean Water SRF, which funds investment in wastewater and stormwater infrastructure, and the Drinking Water SRF, which funds investment in drinking water infrastructure. Um, and the way these funds work is that every year, Congress provides funding to the states um, according to a set formula that divides the total amount up among all the states. Um, the states have to match that amount 20%, they have a 20% match requirement. And then that money that goes into each state's funds, the states can then give it out to communities or utilities, mostly in the form of loans, which then um, revolve back into the state's fund as the loans are repaid, which is why it's called a revolving loan fund. Um, there is an option for states to give out some of the money as grants. Um, they don't do it very much. I think we're gonna talk about that more later. Um, right now, every year, Congress um, puts about $1 billion of new money into the drinking water state revolving fund nationwide. 
And on the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, that number is a little higher. It's around 1.7 billion every year, um, which sounds like a lot, but by comparison um, nationwide, I think the estimate of annual need is around $74 billion a year. So um, yeah. <laughs> Got it. Um, so over the past decades, has that funding, it sounds like we have a massive need, not quite enough money now. Um, and over the past few decades, has that funding been increasing or decreasing, staying the same? What's that been looking like? Sure. Well, so just for a bit of context, um, after the Clean Water Act was enacted back in the early 1970s, um, Congress set up these programs and provided lots of funding to utilities across the country to help them upgrade and meet all these new federal requirements that were being put in place. And that funding was almost entirely in the form of federal grants um, that did not have to be repaid. But then, you know, the 80s rolled around, it was the Reagan era, um, and the federal government, uh, you know, federal spending wasn't looked on as favorably at that time. Um, and so starting it then and continuing to the present day, the amount of funding the federal government has put into these programs has decreased pretty substantially about fourfold between then and now, even as the need has continued to increase. And then on top of that, they switched the program from a primarily grant program to a primarily loan program. So even these you know, federal dollars that are going into these investments are really local dollars because it's local communities that are the ones who have to end up repaying the loans. I believe right now the total is like 96% of public spending on water infrastructure comes from state and local governments, mostly local governments. Got it, so pretty significant change. Um, and Christy, I know you work a lot sort of on the opposite end, right? So Becky's at the working with the federal government in Washington and you work a lot with very local community groups and, and local governments. And what has this long-term decrease and change in funding meant for some local governments and what, what's happening on the ground around the Great Lakes region? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me as well. Um, I think what we see is a competition for funds on dealing with so many issues in the localities, right? And so water is just one piece of that. And so there's just clearly not enough funding and we'll see this backlog or um, a, uh, you know, we'll see some of the utilities not make the needed upgrades that are required um, because of the fact that there's just not enough money. And, that is coming down as um, from the states or from even as grants. In some localities, um, some of the, the smaller communities may not even apply for a loan because of the fact that they have not enough people in their, um, you know, in their community to be able to pay back that potential loan. In some cases, some localities or some small communities aren't even paying, um, some of the community members aren't paying their fees. And so I know that in some places in, in rural Ohio, um, like only 60, uh, some communities are only getting 60% of their fees. And so there's these backlogs of being able to make these upgrades. And then in urban areas, sometimes they have, um, you know, these pockets of low income, um, areas and there is a real need for grants and um, you know, with these water upgrades to uh, in these cities there's just sometimes this causes the water rates to rise substantially and therefore these pockets of low-income people just aren't able to pay the bills and so we start to see um, water shutoffs and some other issues and if these localities aren't able to make these upgrades, then we start to see um, water quality degradate um, and we uh, potentially could see more leaks and water loss in the system, which also raises the water rates to um, residents. Yeah, thanks, Christy. It's complicated. <laughs> um, it sure is. Anthonia, I know that you've been doing a lot of research on the different ways that states in the Great Lakes region interact with these funding programs. And it's my understanding that states actually have a lot of flexibility in how they choose to um, administer these funds and, and work with their local governments. Can you tell us a little bit about how states administer and access that funding? 
Sure, Jen, thank you for having me as well. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on the SRFs since they are the major dedicated funding source for water infrastructure in the US. And as Becky had already explained for the two funds, um, the states get their money, their, their federal capitalization grants, which is what we call that money that comes from the federal government. Um, they get it from the federal government. Usually they're required to provide like a list or like a plan of how they plan to spend that money. And that's usually done about a year or so ahead of the program year. And in addition to that, then they provide the proof of their 20% state match of the federal capitalization grant. Once they get this fund, most states leverage that money by issuing bonds, revenue bonds that are backed by this SRF funds. And it is the proceeds from the funds that they actually give out in form of loans and grants to their applicants. Now, when you look at, and then that's kind of how they access it at the state level. Now, when you look at how it's administered, pretty much all states have a lot of leeway in how they're going to design their own SRF program, whether it's the clean water or the drinking water. Um, they get to design their programs and determine things like eligibility, um, what kind of projects to prioritize, what are the prioritization metrics they're going to use, also to evaluate applications, and, um, and also even the kind of investment they're going to put that money in, in order to generate returns. So you have a lot of leeway, but there are federal parameters or requirements that you have to, you have to abide by, even in, the, in that design. And states can decide not to issue bonds. They can actually just take the money straight from the federal government and give it out directly. Or they can decide to issue bonds. They can decide to prioritize green infrastructure more than lead service line replacement. Another state can decide to prioritize um, septics than um, drinking water issues. It kind of depends on whatever the priorities and the needs of each state needs. Um, and that's sort of how they get a lot of leeway in how they design it. And as Becky had said before, most of this tends to go out in form of low interest loans and sometimes in form of grants. Uh, there's also like a portion of part of the money that comes from the federal government, the federal capitalization grants, that the federal government can stipulate that you need to set aside a percentage of that cap grant for specific purposes. It could be for just paying for the administrative running and management of the fund. Uh, these things are called set aside. And then there's also like another portion, which is called ad additional subsidization, where the federal government would stipulate that the portion of that money you get from the federal government, the cap grant, that you should keep it or use it specifically to provide subsidies to um, either certain kinds of municipalities or applicants, maybe disadvantaged communities, or for specific kinds of projects, maybe to fund technical assistance or to fund lead service line replacement. So you have the parameters that kind of guide it, but each state does have a lot of leeway in how they design, utilize, and disperse their funds. Thanks. You know, we've kind of touched around this a little bit, um, but you know, I want to talk a little bit more about equity. Um, and we know that funding isn't always distributed equitably to support the communities most in need. Um, so Christy, I'm going to start with you on this one. You know, can you tell us a little bit about some of the inequities and barriers um, that you're seeing um, as far as accessing these critical infrastructure dollars? Sure. I think what, you know, what we've heard and what we've kind of talked about is loans have to be paid back, right? And there are people that just are struggling. Do I pay my electric bill? Do I pay my water bill? What am I, what am I going to pay? Because, you know, the community needs to upgrade their water infrastructure. One of the things that we're seeing, though, is a, a real clear need for grant dollars. And there's just not enough grant dollars available. And in some cases where there are grant dollars, um, Many times they don't support some of the poorest pockets in cities. They go to more smaller communities, um, just the way that the state defines like disadvantaged communities. And so there's some money that's set aside for disadvantaged communities and, and the state revolving um, funds that uh, um, both of the other panelists had talked about. And um, so particularly large areas like large urban areas with these pockets. So for instance, like if you take Toledo, the city of Toledo, um, there are five um, neighborhoods in the, in the uh, city that are really struggling to pay all their bills and put food on the table, but they can't access those disadvantaged community funds because they go to smaller communities. Um, and in some cases, some of the things that we have seen is, this is really interesting too to me. So, we provide grants 
to, let's say, sometimes in some cases, polluters. And let's take agriculture as an example. So upstream, and if you think about Toledo again, you have agricultural producers that have been, they get grants, they have access to grants to keep fertilizer and, and uh, manure on their farm fields. But, you know, eventually it does wash off. Um, and so it does pollute the downstream communities that are dealing now with toxic algae and have to do upgrades or provide treatment costs or uh, put treatment trains onto their water utilities at the tune of like last year it was $90,000. But the city doesn't receive a grant for that. And so it has to make these upgrades or you know put those treatment trains on. And so they have to turn around and then raise the rates on ratepayers' backs. And so there's some inequalities there as well. And so I think it really comes down to needing a lot more grant dollars into the system, a lot more funding from the feds. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would say even some criteria at the federal level of defining what a disadvantaged community is rather than leaving it to the states. Because, you know, and at the end of the day, a lot of the urban communities don't even see that money. Yeah. Thanks, Christy. And then, Thony, I know you've been digging into uh, this a lot in your research. Any thoughts from, from your perspective on this? Sure. I think I'll be looking at it from the process of the administration and the disbursement of the funds by the states. Um, if you start from even just the application process for a lot of states, it's generally regarded as being very cumbersome and also costly. And that discourages a lot of municipalities and will be applicants from actually applying for it. Um, and there was a study in 2015 in Illinois by the Metropolitan Planning Council and I think the Illinois EPA and the Mayor's Caucus. And a survey was done of over, I think, 123 municipalities. And out of the respondents, about 71% of them actually stated that they found portions of the application process for the SRFs to be very cumbersome. And um, this just goes to show like this is one of the issues uh, and then beyond that, I mean, there are solutions that you can look at and um, options that other states have explored. Some of them is about streamlining the number of documentation that you need, first of all, and the kind of documentation that you need. Uh, also, the fact that you need a lot of technical information and technical data means that a lot of times you might have to employ the services or the consultants to put your applications together. When that happens or when that is required, what it means is that well-resourced communities are able to put together competitive applications as opposed to less well-resourced communities. And that gives them an edge and, that, and that's an inequity in its own place. One of the ways to address that is to also have um, grants, what you call pre-application grants or pre-planning loans and even providing technical assistance or just in, interest-free pre-planning loans and grants. These are things that you can, these are sort of like the solutions that you can use to address these inequalities. Um, also, uh, something as simple as communications gap is a major issue. You find out that there are municipalities and utilities that will tell you they're not, they're not aware of this program or they're not aware of when it's open and when it closes. And a lot of times that usually is a whole year in advance of the program. And if you're not aware, you cannot apply for the loan. So there's also the question of how do you interact, how do municipalities and, and, and even the administrators actually, how do they interact with will be applicants? Do they have like informational booths? in relevant conferences or industry events? Do they send out um, newsletters regularly to all the utilities and municipalities? Those are sort of like solutions that you can use to bridge that gap. Another thing is also sort of like tran transparency in the process and ensuring that information is readily available. You find that when it comes to like the sector, you um, getting information can be quite difficult. Even just trying to find out from the local utility what your water rate is and how that is calculated can be quite difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, also the point where you might actually need to bring in a, a public request for information as opposed to actually just being able to request as, as a user, as a consumer on that service. So, um, and that way, if you don't know when things like maintenance use plans are going to be compiled, if you don't know when they're going to be available for public review, you can't participate in the process and you're disempowered. You cannot also hold them to account for how the funds are utilized. And th these are some of the things that actually perpetuate inequities within the system. 
Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of challenges, but potentially, you know, I think Antonio and Christy, you're pointing out some opportunities for the, the federal government to sort of change how they're um, uh, organizing this process. And Becky, I'm curious if you see opportunities um, at the federal level to about how these SRFs and other programs are managed to push states and local governments to address some of these inequities. Yeah, a lot of the solutions that Christy and Antonia have mentioned can be implemented at the state level without federal action. For example, things like, um, you know, enhanced outreach to communities to help them become aware of these funds, streamlining applications, things like that. But there are certain things that are written into federal law that the states don't have control over unless the federal government acts. And one of those is that there is, you know, we've mentioned many times that this is primarily a loan program and that grants or you know, additional subsidization, which like why use a one syllable word when you can use an eight syllable phrase. Um, uh, well, it does include things other than grants like other types of subsidies, but I'm using grants as shorthand. So um, where was I? <laughs> it's primarily a loan program. Um, there are some grants available, but the, actually um, the federal statutes cap the amount of um, funding that the states are allowed to provide in the form of grants. Um, on the clean water side, it's capped at 30% of the annual grant that they get from the feds. On the drinking water side, it's a little higher. I believe it's like 35%. Um, and that's a hard limit. Um, we are advocating to change that. I think that's one thing that can be done. Um, and on the other hand, there's, there's no minimum, um, at least on the clean water side. On the drinking water side, there's just a nominal minimum. It's like 6%. So on the clean water side, a lot of states don't provide any funding in the form of, of grants. It's, um, you know, they, they're, I think there's a hesitancy among a lot of state program officers not to deplete the revolving fund by giving out money that isn't going to be repaid, which then has these inequitable impacts in communities. So um, something else that I think should be a top priority at the federal level is to establish, you know, a minimum amount that states need to provide in the form of additional subsidization. Um, so, you know, we're looking, we're looking for that to be incorporated into policy reforms. Um, I would also really love to see um, the EPA, which I think, you know, could do without congressional action, to see the EPA analyze, um, do a nationwide analysis of how funds have been distributed for the, you know, the history of the program, um, like which communities are receiving and benefiting from these funds, because we know that these inequities are happening, that they exist, but the data are very difficult to combine. So I think that would be extremely helpful. Yeah. So we've, we've touched a little bit, we've danced a little bit around affordability. And so I have a couple of questions for you all on that. Um, and, you know, Christy, I know you have an example from, I think, Toledo that has struggled with really high water rates. And there are some uh, uh, historic reasons for that. And, but they're now starting to shift to make some significant efforts to address the affordability issues in Toledo for water and sewer. Can you give us the broad outline of how those rates got so high in Toledo and now what the city is doing to fix the problem? Yeah, I can. Um, I just really want to quickly follow up on something, if I could, I'm sorry, Jen. Um, you know, I think um, something else that's really a barrier is understanding these really cumbersome processes, processes. And I think Antonio was talking about this a little bit, but if you think about it, like you, you are a parent and you are struggling to, you know, get your kids somewhere, you're working. How do you dig into these really complex plans and really understand them? And then also another barrier to um, some of these funds sometimes in communities, um, at least from the individual's perspective, like maybe emergency assistance, is that they're not in your language. Um, they're in English. And so not really understanding how to access that um, or having somebody help you through that process can be a barrier. But um, okay, I will switch. So in Toledo, um, uh, some, so just a Brit, big broad overview, some of the suburbs were, uh, you know, threatening to to walk um, and leave the city of Toledo's uh, Department of Public Utilities water system and go find water elsewhere. Instead of calling their bluff, um, they um, decided to 
work with them in or cave in and um, provide them a bulk water rate. So the suburbs get a bulk water rate. And so this is supposed to rise, you know, uh, Toledo's uh, water rates will rise about 67% over the next five years. And prior to COVID, there was something like 6,000 people in a three month span that either were getting their water turned off, had their water turned off, or got a notice about a water turn off. And so to, you know, 67% rise of your water rate, you can start to think about how many more people are going to have their water turned off. And so, you know, with some persistence and the leadership of the Junction Coalition, Freshwater Future came in to work with our partner and um, was really, like I said, very persistent and kept talking to the city of Toledo. And now we have this really beautiful relationship. Um, and what we did is we came together and we formed what we call an if I might, I keep flipping this around. So I think it's the Consumer Protection and Water Affordability Task Force. And it's made up of, this, of city council, city, Department of Public Utilities. So the mayor's office is there. Um, we have community members and Freshwater Future and then some other organization like Toledo Fair Housing and so forth. And so the city council passed this resolution, you know, saying we're gonna have this water task force. And what we are to work on is things like water affordability, water rates, you know, let's put together a water affordability plan that um, people that are really struggling to pay their, their water bills can get into this program and pay affordable water rates. Emergency assistance for those people that are falling on hard times. So these are two separate things. Affordable waters being able to afford your water and assistance is really for when you fall on those hard times. It's kind of like the Band-Aid to help you through a couple of, you know, a month or two, you know, but a Band-Aid you only wear for about a week. So, and then also debt forgiveness and some other things. So far, we've passed an ordinance to protect um, tenants, renters. So in Toledo, landlords pay the water bill and sometimes they weren't paying their water bill and so the tenants would have the water turned off. And so we passed some protections in an ordinance um, to allow uh, renters to be able to stay in water. We've worked on developing a debt forgiveness program and this hopefully will go before city council here this um, next month. But basically anyone that owes $1,000 or, $1, or less and if they paid their water bill, every month, then a one twelfth of their bill would be forgiven, their debt would be forgiven. And at the end of the year, they would have no debt. Anyone over a thousand dollars, it's over two years. And so um, we're, we've got it all drafted, ready to go. Hopefully city council will take it up um, next month. And so we've also worked together um, to develop a uh, request for proposals on a water affordability study and we, as a community and the city, interviewed a um, few people and we picked one out. And now Roger Colton is who we picked and he's getting underway and doing this study. Um, and together as this water task force, um, we worked on a moratorium to, um, you know, keep water on during COVID and have a, com you know, a verbal commitment to keep water on to residents until water affordability program is in place. So there, that's just kind of the big overview, but there's a lot of really great things that are happening. Um, and I'm really glad that the, you know, the city did come to the table with us. I will also say really quickly, um, we worked with the city to uh, get a grant from the US EPA to hire Blue Conduit to um, model where all the lead lines are. And now we are, uh, and, and also we'll be educating the community members, we'll be educating other community members on how to protect yourself um, from lead. So more to come, it's really exciting. Thanks. It's, what's really interesting there is it, and I, which I think gets to sort of a theme that everybody's been touching on a little bit is, you know, we certainly need these improved federal programs, but there's a role for the state to play, local governments, community groups, citizens, and we're all gonna have to come together to figure out how to handle these things. Um, 
Anthony, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about this, this concept of affordability versus assistance, because that was one that took me a little bit of time to get my head around. And could you maybe just dig into that briefly about and, and what that means as far as sort of maybe some of our program structures? Um, yeah. Uh, sure. I mean, Christy already sort of explained it that the difference between affordability and assistance is like one is sort of looking at long-term solutions to it and assistance is really more like a short-term stopgap to prevent water shortages and ensure that you have access but both of them both of them actually are working towards ensuring that everyone has access to water irrespective of their financial situation or, or their economic background however you need to understand sort of like the link between how funding and financing has affected or impacted affordability. Just to kind of understand where affordability comes in and what it comes in to address. Um, we talk about the fact that yes, we have aging water infrastructure within the Great Lakes region. Um, our infrastructure is about between 50 to 150 years old. It, a lot of it is outdated. It needs to be replaced, it needs to be repaired, it needs to be upgraded and retrofitted to ensure that it's resilient to climate change. And all of that is in, in view of the decline in federal investment in infrastructure. And when you have all of those kind of situations, what you have is that the bulk gets passed down to the states and municipalities who in turn pass it down to the customers in form of high water rates. And now what you have is that the water rates are, are soaring. I think there was, there, was a, the, there was a study that Becky had referred to earlier. And um, in, in that study between 2010 to 2018, I think, the water rates in Chicago and, and Cleveland more than doubled. And if you're looking at all of these issues, you start to realize that you have an affordability problem, but it's a systemic issue. So you need to address it at different points. Now, affordability looks at addressing this kind of um, systemic issues and looking at the rates. How do you set the rates? How do you structure the rates? What are the inequities within the system that you need to address to ensure that water is affordable and accessible to everyone? However, assistance looks at in the meantime, while we're trying to address these long-term issues, what can we do to ensure that people have access to water now and we don't have water shortages? And so you have like customer assistance programs that look at providing discounts and um, arrearages forgiveness like Christy had mentioned. And then that's kind of like the distinction. The, the major aim is ensuring access, but the routes together is a bit different for the two of them. Thanks, Antonia. Um, as I suspected, we could probably, I know we could talk all day, not probably talk all day, um, but I do want to get to our audience questions, but I have one more question for our panel um, and for our audience. I see some questions trickling in. Use that question in the Q&A button down at the bottom to submit a question. Um, we'll try to get to as many of them as I can. Um, but Becky, I, you know, we've hinted a little bit, you know, that it, we know we're hearing from the Biden administration, from Congress, that they are really starting to look at putting together some significant legislation around infrastructure. And so you know, I'm curious what, what things look like from your place, your seat in Washington. Um, and, uh, you know, can, can this really happen? What's the likelihood of, of a major infrastructure bill? And, you know, what's your view on that? Um, it's a really good question. Um, we have a joke in DC that it's always infrastructure week because we always talk about how, you know, infrastructure is this bipartisan issue that, you know, it's going to be easy to make progress on. And then for one reason or another, it like never happens. So it's just infrastructure week is um, eternal. Um, that said, I, I think I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll see infrastructure legislation move later this year. Um, it just it there's so many question marks about what process you know would be used like if no republicans are going to participate then it would need to pass through this reconciliation process that was just used to pass the covid relief bill um and uh there's pretty strict limitations on the kinds of things that can go into such a bill um it's really a funding vehicle so if that's the way Forward, then we could see big funding numbers for a lot of infrastructure programs, but we might not see any of the policy reforms that we've been advocating for, you know, any sort of new requirements or um, new restrictions, anything that is a substantive change in how the program is administered would probably not be eligible to be included in the reconciliation bill. So, um, you know, it's still very much up in the air. I also am hearing that 
the first reconciliation package was so taxing on our legislators that they're kind of cooling off on the idea of doing another one. And so um, the timing is, is really uncertain. Um, but we're still pushing hard for that funding. Um, I think one thing that probably could get into a reconciliation bill might be um, you know, a, a set aside for disadvantaged communities in the form of grants. Um, that might be allowable under the rules, although the rules are very unclear to everyone, even the staff on the Hill who are working on this. Um, but yeah, I, I would say I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> Well, step in the right direction. I'll take cautiously optimistic. <laughs> um, I will note that, um, you know, we do know, and I think everybody here would agree that um, letters and calls to your members of Congress on this issue are really important. They help. Um, and it's going to be really important over the next, you know, weeks, months, years to continue to remind your legislators in Washington that these issues are really important. Um, you can send a letter. Uh, I'll plug our action center. It's greatlakes.org slash take action. You can send a letter on these priorities um, to your members of Congress. Um, and certainly we encourage you to do that um, to bolster all the work that everybody on this call is doing um, and to add your voice. Um, again, use the Q&A function to ask some questions. Uh, I see a number of questions in here. And one of them is asking about um, uh, you know, conservation and in innovation benefits, um, you know, opportunities to just have rate payers use less water, um, you know, low flow toilets and all those kinds of things we hear about. Um, and certainly my understanding is that's one piece of the puzzle, but it's not going to fix this whole problem. So I don't know if any of you have any thoughts on the role that conservation programs can or can't play in addressing our infrastructure woes. Well, I can jump in. So um, I do think that conservation, you know, like you talked about the low flow toilets and all of that can be really helpful. Um, some, some utilities will um, charge like a, a flat rate for um, a use of water. So if you're below that, you know, amount of water, then you may not even benefit from the conservation practice. Um, if that, if, if you're following me, so, um, you may, let's just say, let's for ease of purpose, right? Like 10 gallons, everybody gets charged for 10 gallons, but you decide you're actually using only five. So you're still paying for that 10. That doesn't mean that they're really, that they're not really important because they are, because, you know, most of the time we actually use more than that block rate that you're paying for. Um, but it does bring up an inequality because there are people that just cannot afford to pay to put low flow toilets in or low flow shower heads. And in some cases, some of these poor um, pockets and, and family members may have like four, five, six, seven people living in a house. And so they're really important, but I think that we're gonna need to be able to provide grants to these individuals or these families to be able to put in these water conservation measures as well. So big proponent, um, but you know, there's some inequalities that I have been seeing over the past year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, we have some kind of more technical questions here, but, um, you know, again, there's some questions that are getting at um, this question of, uh, uh, you know, some, most of these programs being provided in terms of loans. Um, and uh, this person says it seems that the poorest communities would be most vulnerable because they'd be the least be able to repay the loans to improve infrastructure, which I think is a, an important takeaway from the conversation. And so I don't know if so, anybody wants to um, dig in a little bit more into maybe how some of these grant programs could be more equitably distributed um, to support those communities that can least afford to pay. Becky or Anthony, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, I mean, I can say a few words. Um, I mean, just, I mean, this commenter is exactly right that the, you know, lower income communities are very vulnerable and that the current system basically establishes a two tier system in this country where wealthier communities that can afford loans get good functioning infrastructure 
and lower income communities that can't afford the loans are left with systems that don't work that you know provide polluted water, contaminated water. Um, and so that's obviously not something that we want. Um, obviously, I think the first thing that needs to happen is just make more grant funding available. Right now, there isn't enough to go around. And the communities that, um, as Antonia mentioned earlier, that are like savvier with all the different you know, forms and processes that you have to go through to get money are, they're gonna have an advantage over maybe smaller communities with less resources that don't have the in-house like technical expertise to apply for the funding. Um, and so, you know, make, make more grant funding available, make technical assistance available so that all communities can equally access the, the funding that is there. Antonia, is there anything else you wanna say on this? Yes. Um... One of the propositions that you find is about pooling resources. So if you're a small community and you don't have enough resources or you don't have a big enough or wide enough customer base to be able to generate revenue to pay back those loans, the idea is if you have other small communities around you, you can pull resources together. If, if the program design allows you to put in joint applications and apply jointly, um, but of course, that means you have to ensure that you have shared priorities that you're applying for, and you have to have a way of dividing all of that and utilizing it and reporting out on it. But um, sort of like pulling your resources can also help. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, so we have a question about community flooding, right? And so this is a situation that happens during heavy rainstorms where the, the water and the sewer system, the, the stormwater system can't uh, manage the major flow of water, particularly in cities where there's a lot of um, uh, impervious surfaces. And so if, because all the water can't fit down the pipes during a heavy storm, you end up with flooding in your neighborhood, sort of blocking up streets, sometimes running into people's homes. Um, and there's a question here about whether or not flooding concerns can be addressed by money from the SRFs, the state revolving funds. And I think this is really getting at a question about something we call green infrastructure um, and how, you know, I know that all of you have ideas on how we could improve the use of the SRFs for those programs. And so, Antonia, could you explain really quickly, like what green infrastructure is, um, how that addresses flooding? And then I know there are opportunities, we'd like to be able to use those SRFs more for that kind of thing. Could you explain that really briefly for us? I know that's a lot. <laughs> Okay, um, so green infrastructure basically is about using nature-based solutions and nature-based processes to ameliorate the issues of stormwater flooding. Um, so ordinarily, if you do not, if you haven't paved over or graded over a surface, right, you have natural soil, and when rain falls on that soil, part of that water washes off in runoff, but part of that water is absorbed into the soil, eventually percolates over time and enters into the water table. But when you have impervious surfaces as we have in a lot of um, developed areas, that water cannot be absorbed. It has to either go into the sewer, and if the sewer is not, is not big enough to contain it at that period of time, then you have sewer overflows or it washes off and runoff, right? So green infrastructure basically is looking at measures that imitate these natural processes and um, using them as an alternative to what you call built infrastructure or what we refer to as gray infrastructure like sewers. It doesn't necessarily mean that it obviates the need for gray infrastructure. It's supposed to be used to complement gray infrastructure. And um, I mean, there are arguments for and against and the fact that you can have multiple benefits from green infrastructure. For example, if you have um, street medians that you plant trees and plants that absorb water and are able to retain and hold on to water, that way you, you find that the rate of the flow of the flooding, for example, is reduced and mitigated. And it sort of allows for a bit of time for the sewers to be able to empty its contents before the water is released over time into the sewers as well. Um, and, and, but it doesn't end with that because you have the aesthetic effects of having such nice shrubs in your neighborhood. You have the impact on even property values. You have even the air refining and, and, and um, air quality, improved air quality. Those are, those are like multiple benefits that you can get from it. And the arguments for green infrastructure is that because of all those multiple benefits that you can get, a lot of agencies and um, city agencies and municipalities can come together and jointly fund this kind of project. It doesn't have to sit with just one body or agency because somehow everyone kind of gets a benefit from it. Thanks, Antonia. Uh, Becky and Christy, I don't know if you want to add in anything on the, that, that question. Yeah. Um, 
So in, they're bringing it back to the SRFs. Um, these projects are eligible uh, for SRF um, funding. Um, I will say that a very over you know the course of the, the program history, very a very small, tiny fraction of dollars have gone toward green infrastructure projects. Um, the vast majority, uh, you know, in the wastewater space, have gone toward just like hard infrastructure fixes to to overflows. Like I live in the DC area, you know, they're building a two and a half billion dollar tunnel um, to stop combined sewer overflows. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that that is funded at least partially through SRF loans. Um, there is a, uh, a provision that's been attached to SRF funding for the last few years um, that sets aside 20% of the annual capitalization grant to the states for what's called the Green Project Reserve. And that means that, you know, assuming a state gets enough project applications, they have to give out 20% like 20% of the funding they give out that year has to go toward green projects, which is a category that includes green infrastructure, but also water efficiency and energy efficiency upgrades. Um, and so actually most of those dollars end up going to energy efficiency upgrades. This has been very popular at um, treatment facilities, but yeah, we would like to see more, more of that money go towards green infrastructure, which is so beneficial. Um, I'll just like to add, that beyond the SRFs, there are also actually other sources of funding, even at the federal and state level, that you can use for green infrastructure. You have, even just from the US Department of Agriculture, you have um, Federal Emergency Management Agency. You have, if you, it depends on basically the kind of projects. You have to probably tailor that project to satisfy the requirement of the agency that, that administers the fund, but you can incorporate green infrastructural elements into that project. So it does serve the purpose for example, if it's a transportation project, it serves the purpose of transportation, and so you can get the funding from transportation, but it also serves the purpose of green infrastructure. Yeah, and I think that's a, an important point, Anthonia, is that, you know, these are not, you know, we think of like, well, just the water and sewer department, but the water and sewer department are going to have to work with a whole lot of other people to make all this happen. Um, so I know that we have already run over our time, um, so I'm going to start to wrap things up. Um, but huge thanks, Becky, Christy, and Antonia for being very generous with your time and your expertise today. I know I learned a lot. I hope that this was informative for all the people who joined us today. Um, as Becky mentioned, uh, you know, there's going to be hopefully a lot of opportunities at the federal level um, to advocate for additional funding and some improvements to these programs. Um, certainly, uh, the Alliance will keep all of you informed about that and provide opportunities to get involved. Um, we will be sending out an email later today with some uh, additional links and a link to this recording. We encourage you to share it with others who might be interested in this topic. Um, and don't miss our fourth and final webinar in this series, um, which is coming up on uh, is Wednesday, March 24th, I think. I don't have my calendar right in front of me, um, but we'll dig into our fifth priority, uh, which is uh, the issue of agricultural pollution. So I'm, I'm also excited for that um, presentation. I'm revealing my severe nerdiness here. I'm excited about infrastructure, excited about agriculture, all these things. Um, so huge thank you again, Becky, Antonia, and Christy. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees who joined us today for this conversation. Thanks so much and have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.